So welcome back. It's time to resume the session. So it's uh, my pleasure to introduce Professor Nicola Marzari from EPFL, who is going to uh, present uh, the concepts uh, about maximally localized uh, Vanier function. Again, take the uh, opportunity to uh, ask questions by the end of the talk. Nicola, please. Great. Uh, thanks, uh, Andrea. And thanks uh, to Matteo, Yuri, Andrea, and Nicola for organizing all of this. That, does the microphone work? Uh, can you hear me? Uh, great. Um, so we'll be talking about uh, uh, Vanier functions uh, and uh, so that uh, you can happily uh, go back. Uh, <laughs> go back uh, to sleep, uh, uh, I start uh, with the conclusions. Um, so um, I'll summarize, uh, you know, what were the original developments and where we stand uh, on this uh, set of algorithms uh, to transform uh, extended block states into localized uh, Vanier states. Uh, the challenge was to do this in solids, uh, but actually the math uh, would equally work uh, to molecules or uh, anything in between. And you'll see we'll operate uh, uh, in the language of solid uh, with field bands, anti-bands, uh, all the bands that we calculate or target uh, manifold. And in particular, finally, this year, after I would say 27 years, um, we have a set of uh, algorithms uh, that can make uh, all of this uh, fully automated. Uh, why are Vanier functions relevant, say, for modern electronic structure? Um, originally, it was uh, the project was driven by linear scaling approaches, um, but uh, very quickly applications uh, had to do with uh, you know having descriptors of chemical bonding, uh, interpolators of quantum mechanical operators, energy bands in particular, velocity and many others, um, using Vanier functions as, as building blocks for the electronic structure. Um, there is an exact connection with the modern theory of polarization, so they. Um, really act as a fingerprints and coarse graining of the electrons. Um, more recent developments and recent, I mean, probably, you know, 15 years ago, uh, they are, uh, you know, markers of topological signatures and obstructions. And very much in the spirit of this uh, um, uh, workshop, uh, they are actually an excellent approximation to what you'll see later in the week on Kopman's uh, variational orbitals, uh, but they can also be a natural manifold uh, for the Hubbard projectors, or they can be useful, say, to separate uh, uh, many body electrons uh, from the FT electrons in the spirit of uh, uh, something that was mentioned by uh, Davide Ceresoli. Also, uh, starting with the acknowledgement, the project indeed started in 1996 uh, with David Vanderbilt. Ivo Sousa joined us soon and we did the disentanglement, and then uh, Rash Mostofi and Jonathan Yates. Um, Giovanni Pizzi at EPFL and uh, in the recent years, Antio Marazza and Jun Feng Chao have given, uh, you know, some of the core contribution, uh, but the ecosystem of contributors uh, is uh, much larger than this. Uh, on the theoretical side, uh, there is this uh, review, there is a Vanier 90 community paper and a website uh, if you are interested uh, on all of this. Now, as I said, uh, we use the language of solids. And uh, the first thing to remember is that uh, we are going to have a, a, a direct lattice uh, that is defined by our uh, whatever cell, primitive cell or supercell. And we have a uh, translation vectors, A1, A2, and A3 that define uh, this Brave lattice, uh, one of the 14 possible, say, if we are in three dimensions. And the dual uh, to that is the reciprocal lattice, and we'll have, uh, uh, you know, the basis vector of the reciprocal uh, lattice that are duals with respect to the primitive. And it's very important uh, because the primitive cell in the reciprocal lattice, what is called the De Bruyne zone, is actually what we conventionally use to label the eigenstates uh, of the Hamiltonian. So most often uh, in periodic systems, uh, we exploit a block theorem, the fact that the Hamiltonian commutes uh, with all the possible lattice translations, and that uh, implies that we can choose eigenstates of the periodic Hamiltonians that have this block form. They are not periodic in themselves, but they are given by a periodic function times a modulation. 
and we have two quantum numbers, a band index N discrete. So if you think at the valence band of silicon, uh, you know, spin unpolarized, you and would go from one to four. And then at the K that defines this modulation uh, is chosen to be uh, within uh, the first uh, Brillouin zone. And uh, you can prove this uh, quite, um, quite easily. So how do things look like? Uh, you know, suppose that we have a one dimensional system. We have this red band dispersion. This is the entire one dimensional Brillouin zone from minus pi over lattice parameter to pi over A. If we take a block state at k equals zero, the modulation is zero. So it's just a periodic part, periodic part, periodic part. If instead we are outside the origin, there is a k that modulates it. And because we are outside the origin, the wavelength is going to be, say, very long if we are close to k, if we are close to gamma, and it will become shorter and shorter as we reach uh, the zone boundary and uh, it changes sign at every primitive cell. But, uh, you know, in black, uh, you can see our psi block state uh, modulated uh, by the green plane wave. So this is what uh, we have. This is what, uh, say, quantum espresso calculates with you in the language of density functional theory. At uh, any k points in the grid that you choose, it will calculate for you uh, the periodic part uh, of this uh, uh, psi k, and then of course you just need to modulate it. And uh, if you look at the Hamiltonian diagonalized uh, in sort of uh, our basis set of uh, plane waves, you can plot it along, uh, say, high symmetry lines in the blue end zone. And uh, you see here the four valence bands of silicon. Uh, silicon as uh, two atoms per primitive cell, and each silicon atom has four valence electrons. So we have eight valence electrons periodically repeated infinite times. There is a no spin polarization, so there is a spin degeneracy. And so there are these four W occupied states that rather than labeling with the position in real space, we label them a la block with N that goes from one to four, and uh, with K here along a path in the Brian zone. And if you look at the uh, lead, it looks a lot like silicon. It's just that because it's much larger, there is a uh, much more overlap and the conduction bands have come down and actually are below the top of the valence. And so lead is actually a metal and silicon is a semiconductor. And uh, these very complicated bands are actually very simple. If you look at a parabola, uh, but a parabola that is plotted using the language of the high symmetry path. So this is actually why sort of, you know, vanilla density functional theory does uh, so well for silicon, because silicon is basically the homogeneous electron gas uh, with very little perturbation. Okay, so what we want to do is follow up on what, uh, say, uh, Gregory Vanier, uh, moving from Switzerland to the States, uh, did... Uh, uh, in the 1930s, that is, uh, he said, well, let's do a Fourier transform. Uh, let's uh, take, uh, say, a certain band, uh, think of this uh, band here, and uh, we actually perform uh, this integral. So we sweep uh, the entire Brillouin zone, we multiply it uh, by this uh, phase factor, and now what we get uh, is a new object that is called a Vanier function that doesn't depend on the k-index uh, that has been integrated but depends on this uh, capital R index. And uh, you'll see in a moment uh, what are the properties uh, that uh, Vanier was uh, uh, aiming at. Uh, but the first thing uh, to realize is that uh, this is not a well-defined transformation. Uh, the Schrodinger equation or just the density functional theory in a single determinant uh, formalism doesn't fix the phase factor of your block orbitals. You can take your block orbital, you can multiply it by a phase factor, and it still gives the same charge density or orbital density gives the same contribution to any expectation value because uh, the phase factor cancel in the bra and in the cat. It's actually very relevant, but that goes outside what you see today, uh, that uh, you know the loop integrals of the phases have actually 
a physical meaning, and in particular, you know, there is all the modern theory of polarization that uh, really integrates uh, this to obtain uh, the very phase upon parallel transport and show that is related uh, to the electrical polarization. Uh, but uh, right now, we can state that uh, at the very least, uh, we have in this Vanier transformation an indeterminate, an indeterminacy that is uh, for every band at every k point, uh, we can have a random phase factor. And uh, any electronic such a code uh, will have a random phase factor. Okay, there is uh, no magic that whatever comes out of your diagonalization could have uh, anything in here. Now, there is a more general statement that I'll come to a moment, but uh, let me also uh, tell you in a very heuristic way why the result of uh, this Vanier transformation uh, is meant to be localized. That is, if we look at this object as we say move away from, uh, say, here I'm thinking at a transformation done with the capital R being zero, so that the phase is zero here. And uh, we want to look at this object as we go towards infinity, as we move very far away from the home primitive cell that uh, we have chosen uh, as a reference. And uh, we are going to look at the value of this object. I hope there is no mathematician in the room, otherwise they might faint, but we are going to look at the values of this object, uh, not at a general point, uh, but uh, at uh, larger and larger lattice vectors, okay? So we are going towards infinity, but uh, we just calculated this Vanier function that should be localized in the origin uh, primitive cell at uh, Bravais lattice uh, capital Ri. And you can see that when this is very large, uh, in this integral, uh, this uh, phase factor will oscillate uh, furiously. And if you are lucky, it might give you zero. So this is our demonstration that as uh, R diverges, uh, uh, is going, uh, uh, you know, this Vanier function is going to go to zero. There is better demonstration for coming, but uh, just to give you a little bit of the flavor. So, uh, as I was saying, uh, there is a broader, more general, uh, we call them gauge and transformation. In this case, uh, in our single determinant picture, suppose for a moment, uh, uh, that we have uh, two bands, uh, n equal to one and equal uh, to two. And uh, at a certain k here at the zone boundary, uh, we have these uh, two states. Uh, uh, we can perform, in this case, a two by two unitary transformation. Now, this is just the complex uh, generalization of orthogonal transformation. U times U dagger is equal to one. Uh, but basically, this rotated, uh, block uh, functions here uh, are going uh, again uh, to give us uh, uh, the same charge density, the same uh, total energy, if uh, we are dealing uh, with bands uh, that don't uh, mix uh, with all other bands. So when we say for, uh, say, a composite group of bands, uh, so a group of bands uh, that doesn't mix with the rest, uh, you can uh, mix them uh, all together uh, with unitary transformations uh, and your observables uh, are not going uh, to change. And so in say the Vanier vision, what we have is uh, this, the Vanier transformation. Uh, we could do a Vanier transformation of one band. We could do a Vanier transformation of three bands. This is gallium arsenide. We could do a Vanier transformation of the four bands. And uh, basically what we have is that the shape of the resulting Vanier functions will depend uh, by these uh, matrices uh, that are, uh, you know, four by four or three by three, depending on what we want uh, to mix together and have to be figured out, have to be defined at every K. So this is the catch uh, that uh, we can't uh, take the results uh, from any code and perform this transformation and obtain something meaningful unless uh, we figure out uh, how to choose uh, 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 wisely, uh, these uh, arbitrary unitary rotations that are not uh, defined by our quantum mechanics. Now, no matter uh, what uh, this you are, the Vanier transformation 
satisfies uh, these uh, three very important uh, properties. Uh, that is, uh, uh, because uh, it's, uh, you know, if you want here now, it's a double unitary transformation. It's a discrete one at every K point and is a continuous one as this integral over the K point. But at the end, uh, the Rn span the same space as the Psi, you know? So they are just a, you know, reformulation of the problem as in classical mechanics. Uh, you can choose to sit on the sun and look at the planet spins or sit on the earth and look at the sun spin as uh, you know, in the older days. Uh, the other thing is that uh, um, each one of these uh, Vanier function that we can write in this cat form or just in single quantization uh, like this uh, uh, will be a translational image uh, if we send R into R plus R prime, okay? So if we change uh, this, uh, R into R plus R prime, we just uh, translate the result, uh, no matter what the U's are, and no matter what the U's are, all these Vanier functions are orthogonal. So these are all very good, uh, you know, qualities, uh, uh, but uh, what uh, remains, uh, you know, the last uh, freedom uh, is actually how to choose uh, this, uh, uh, this, uh, this U in a transformation that, as I said, could involve uh, one band, three bands, uh, or four bands, and what we we'll want to achieve is a target where we transform this band into a meaningful localized orbitals, these three bands into three meaningful localized orbitals, or these four bands into four uh, meaningful localized orbitals. Now, a very simple way to choose uh, this uh, phase factor is doing uh, a projection. That is, uh, if you for a moment, I remember that uh, we needed to find a U matrix. I think of this as a U matrix that uh, rotates uh, my original block orbitals uh, into Vanier functions. Uh, what one could do is, uh, you know, figure out uh, what the target uh, should be. Maybe uh, we are here. This is Galio mass, and I, this looks a lot like the covalent bond. And let's take a projector that is a bit like a Gaussian mid mid bond okay so if we do that we choose a gaussian mid bond and we calculate this uh, scalar product uh, well this is not going to be an orthonormal uh, sorry a unitary matrix uh, but when we can unitarize it uh, by doing uh, different uh, things like doing a uh, loading orthogonalization so construct uh, these different quantities and then uh, this is a proper uh, unitary transformation and uh, what you get uh, is actually something that uh, in many sort of intuitive cases uh, if your projectors uh, were uh, you know a very intuitive choice uh, for what we should obtain so if we knew the solutions uh, you get something that is fairly well localized and fairly meaningful but we wanted to develop uh, a more general recipe uh, at the time this was driven by linear scaling methods. So with David, we said, that, well, if we want to do linear scaling methods that are based on localized orbitals, we need to understand what is the nature of localization of the orbitals, say, in this case of density functional theory. And so we said, that, well, this is our Vanier transformation, and uh, we want uh, to make sure that the result, uh, that is that our choice of the U matrices is a such that it uh, minimizes something trivial. That is, it minimizes the spread of the Vanier functions of the expectation values of R square around the center. At the time when we were so ignorant of the field that we didn't know that the chemists had done this in the 1960s. And uh, that's what, uh, say, boys had done in Cambridge. And luckily there was a chemist visiting us sometimes to look at this and says, well, this was done in the 1960s, and the chemist developed in the 1960s a number of localization methods. This goes under the name of Foster Boys in molecules. There are other localization strategies or criteria. Now, there is the uh, Edmiston uh, Ruden, 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 uh, Rudenbeck criterion that maximizes the self interaction. Uh, there is the pipec mese and so on. And so these ideas uh, were actually there. Uh, the issue, and I'll come to that in a moment, uh, is that all of these uh, 
uh, is uh, very ill-defined in the solid state. So if you want to calculate uh, what is the average uh, position uh, for a localized orbital, it's just a trivial integral in the solid state is ill-defined. And luckily, David, uh, together with Raffaele Resta, had uh, just uh, cut a little bit of this, uh, this problem uh, based on some earlier literature that I'll mention in a, uh, in a moment. But uh, say we said, uh, well, we define this uh, localiz localization criterion. Uh, the sum of the individual spread of the Vanier functions needs to be minimum. And we want to find uh, what are the U matrices at every K point uh, such that in this transformation, omega is minimized. And so if you want, uh, this is our strategy. We calculate uh, the Psi, let's say with uh, quantum espresso, and then uh, we perform uh, this uh, two unitary transformation. And uh, we, you'll see we iteratively refine these few matrices uh, until uh, the result, uh, this, Vanier, this set of Vanier function is uh, as localized as possible. And again, if we think at the valence bands of a typical semiconductor like gallium arsenide or a silicon, uh, what we are going to find is uh, four Vanier functions in each primitive cell. And remember, the property of the Vanier transformation is such that if you go from, say, this cell to this cell, they are just going to be periodic images. So the entire complexity of electronic structure is in the shape of a four Vanier functions, so wherever they might be for all the electrons of silicon that at the end are just eight and there is no spin. And, uh, okay. So this is uh, what I'll explain, uh, this uh, algorithm, how it applies, uh, how it works, uh, and uh, what are the results. One of the sort of neat things that we realized uh, very quickly uh, when we looked uh, at this uh, functional is that uh, this uh, can be decomposed uh, into two. So omega is the sum of omega i and omega tilde. You see what uh, we are doing is uh, adding and subtracting the, you know, off diagonal terms in terms of being, uh, you know, away from, uh, say, a reference a primitive cell and uh, uh, for a, a different linear uh, function. So, so this two sum to omega, uh, this one is a very obviously positive definite. What is very important is that this one is also positive definite and is gauge invariant. That is, no matter what you, you choose, no matter how you rotate, this is not going to change. And so in practice, minimizing omega is equivalent to minimizing the omega tilde. Omega i is not going to change. How to prove that is very simple. Maybe I don't go through the proof, but basically we rewrite omega i using the projection operator on all the occupied manifold in real space. Yeah, remember that it's equivalent looking at real and reciprocal. And the q is the complement in the Hilbert space of the plane waves. Uh, with respect to P. And so you can see that omega i can be written as a sum of uh, terms that are a positive definite and are just defined in terms of the projectors. And the projectors are going to be uh, invariant with respect to a unitary transformation, because if you, you know, send RM in RM U dagger and RM uh, um, dry in U R M, the, of course, a projector on the manifold is not going to change. So this just tells you, because we can write them uh, uh, purely in terms of these projector operators, uh, that uh, this term is invariant with respect to the internet transformation. And from this form, you can see that it is positive there. Now is uh, where the conundrum is. Uh, that is, uh, the, this operator, the position operator that we needed to define the center of our orbitals, the square anything, uh, R3, any power of R is uh, ill defined in reciprocal, so is ill, ill defined in a solid. Now, if we do this integral in real space of this term, of course, if I have a molecule, I'm uh, in good shape here. But if I have a block orbital, the phase goes away. Uh, but, uh, you know, this term 
oscillates uh, forever, and x times this term uh, doesn't give you uh, uh, an integral that is uh, convergent. Luckily, uh, in uh, 1965, Blount uh, Bell Labs uh, had uh, shown uh, this uh, identity. So there is a very beautiful uh, solid state physics paper from him that really sorts out uh, all the math. I mean, and I guess, you know, if we had known of this uh, and read this paper in, in the 1960s, all the very phase uh, would have come out uh, very naturally. But basically, uh, the Blount uh, so called uh, identities here just uh, for uh, the position operator, but uh, you have them uh, for any power of the position operator, show you that the expectation in real space uh, over a Vanier function of the position operator is equal to this uh, Berry phase, basically this integral of uh, the Berry connection, uh, thanks uh, to these uh, identities. And so to calculate, uh, say, the expectation value of R, we really need to calculate the integrals of the gradient. And to calculate the expectation values of R squared, we need to calculate integrals of the Laplacian and so on and so forth. And so we need to calculate, say, gradients, and we need to calculate Laplacians and so on. And uh, in the code, uh, we decided to do it uh, very rudimentally um, uh, using the uh, finite differences. Uh, and so all the gradients uh, that we have uh, to calculate here are calculated as uh, finite differences uh, um, using uh, basically in three dimension these identities uh, where if you have uh, a uniform, uh, say, Monkost pack mesh of K points uh, where there are uh, B vectors uh, that point uh, from one K point uh, to its neighbors, and then we generalize this uh, to more complex, uh, say, uh, space groups and so more complex uh, shells. But suppose that we had just a cubic system with six, eight, or 12 uh, first neighbors, the gradient uh, can be just done in this uh, vectorial form. And the difference is taking whatever quantity you want to take the gradient of uh, at all the neighboring uh, uh, points. And uh, then uh, with the Blount identities, uh, here uh, is uh, what uh, goes in. And so the key uh, ingredients uh, for uh, all our algorithms uh, are these uh, scalar products. Uh, that is, uh, we want to have a finite difference representation of the gradient. Uh, and so we need to calculate the scalar product between any periodic part of the block orbital at a certain k point and any periodic part of uh, uh, the block orbital at a nearby k point and for all bands, and then with some agile map, uh, one can actually show this is a bit easier to see that uh, the center of the Vanier function is just given by this, you know, sum over the Brian zone, and for every point, uh, you look at all the neighbors, uh, and basically what you are taking is the average of the imaginary part of the logarithm of this diagonal matrix, and this is building up the Vanier center, and this is the expression for the R square. Don't want you to remember, just you know, understand that once we have said that this, we have an expression for the localization functional omega or for the omega tilde that we want to minimize in terms of these M matrices that are scalar product. So the Vanier code never sees the representation that the electronic structure code has of the periodic part of the block orbitals. It only works with the scalar products, and that's why the Vanier code uh, is, uh, you know, naturally interfaced with, you know, any electronic structure code of choice, so plane wave codes, uh, but also FLAPW codes, LMTO codes, and so on and so forth, because it doesn't see the representation of, uh, say, the eigenstates. It only sees uh, scalar products and everything, uh, is uh, in terms of unitary matrices uh, in the, this uh, space of scalar products. And uh, what we want is uh, we want uh, now to minimize uh, our localization functional uh, with respect uh, to all possible uh, unitary matrices. And so in reality, what we want to find is, uh, you know, a steepest descent, a conjugate gradient recipe to start uh, from 
wherever we are and to go downhill. And so we want to calculate the gradient of the localization functional with respect to an arbitrary set of uh, unitary transformation. And if we are talking about gradient, that is, uh, we want to look at what happens in the case of an infinitesimal rotation of the block orbitals. And if, uh, you know, u is infinitesimal, it can be written as an anti Hermitian matrix uh, W. And so the gradient of the localization functional with respect to an infinitesimal uh, change, that is with respect to an anti Hermitian matrix, has uh, again an expression that is very complex in terms of this uh, super operators A and S, but at the end, the only thing that uh, is uh, inside there are a fairly complex mathematical expression uh, that uh, are built out of the M M N matrices. And uh, these are some of the details. So we have everything now. So we can start from our calculation. We calculate uh, at every K point in our non cost pack mesh, these uh, M M N matrices. Uh, and then uh, we ask uh, the Vanier code to minimize the functional omega by doing, uh, you know, gradients are taking a finite step, then gradient again, a finite step, gradient again. And so we create a sequence of a small unitary transformation until we can transform this, in this case, four silicon bands into four Vanier functions that for silicon look, you know, very satisfactorily as, you know, a representation of the chemical bonds. If you take a gallium arsenide, the anion will, uh, you know, polarize uh, these Vanier functions towards itself. If you are disordered, your Vanier function becomes uh, distorted. But uh, sometimes uh, you actually have, uh, you know, defects uh, that are not anymore geometric coordination defects, but are electronic structure defects. And so the Vanier functions can tell you what's happening. And if you do all of this in a molecule, you get uh, what uh, Foster and Boyce had obtained, that is uh, localized molecular orbitals uh, corresponding to the carbon-hydrogen bond, the carbon-carbon bonds, uh, and here are uh, the banana bonds uh, that uh, the chemist actually disliked, uh, and that's why they moved uh, from the foster Boyce representation to the edmiston rudenberg representation that was uh, more satisfactory, um, but to that later. And as I said, you know, some of the first applications were actually driven very much by a collaboration we had with Michele Farinello, that of course was uh, interested, you know, these were also the fairly early days of Carl Farinello molecular dynamics, uh, was interested not anymore at perfect solids, but amorphous solids, uh, liquids, and so on. And this was a neat example, again, at looking at the Vanier functions uh, for the case of amorphous silicon for which they had very good uh, models coming from Carparinello molecular dynamics. And uh, what was very important that uh, we were showing uh, that there was uh, not a one-to-one -one correspondence between an electronic defect and a geometric coordination. So you could have, say, states that look fourfold coordinated from a geometric analysis, but in reality, maybe one of the Vanier function was not spanning equivalent bonds as fourfold coordinated silicon should do. Uh, but we're much more looking at uh, like a low pair. One of the neat, uh, maybe later results uh, was really driven by Gianluca Panaffi, uh, that is a mathematician at the University of Rome, and he was uh, an expert on, uh, say, differential manifolds and topology. And uh, he had uh, proven uh, some of the complex uh, uh, theorem uh, that actually had to do with the uh, churn number triviality of what are called, uh, you know, the block. Uh, uh, manifolds and basically uh, he was able uh, to prove uh, that uh, uh, you know a, a sufficient condition to have uh, exponential localization say in a three-dimensional system was that the, the chair number uh, was going to be equal to zero and later they also proved uh, that uh, not only and this is a proof that had escaped uh, you know some of the grades of uh, uh, electronic structure theory like the Walter Cohn or uh, uh, the Cloiseau or Jay Zaka, 
but he was able to prove not only that uh, there exist uh, exponentially localized Vanier functions in insulators, but also that the Vanier functions that are localized by R, say Foster boys uh, functional, are exponentially localized. So the second step, that's where uh, Ivo Sousa came, uh, is uh, what do we do if we don't have a composite group of bands? That is, uh, if we don't have these bands that we mix them together, but they are separated across the Brillouin zone from other manifolds. And I use the example of uh, uh, copper here, and this is the band structure of copper to tell you what we would like uh, to do. Uh, and now we have gone from something exactly to something heuristic. That is, you know, we always say, well, the band structure of copper is given by five flat D bands, you know, localized, a very little overlap, and one very dispersive parabolic S bands coming from the 4S electron. So 3D flat, 4S parabolic. How do we separate this spaghetti? How do we extract uh, this 5D bands? Well, that's at a certain level mission impossible. That is, there is always going to be here somewhere, you know, in some corners of the Brillouin zone, areas where all the bands, the 5D and the 1S band are mixed together. And so, we are going to, you know, again, define the criterion of uh, optimal disentanglement that, uh, you know, tries to extract uh, from, uh, you know, this uh, spaghetti, a manifold of target dimensionality, in this case uh, of dimensionality five, uh, that then once it's been uh, extracted, we are going to maximally localize and get something that we think should make a lot of sense, like the d orbitals of copper. And uh, the geometrical criterion that we introduced was that of optimal smoothness. That is, we want to extract a manifold of dimension five that as we walk around the Brillouin zone has as little change of character as possible. It's uh, as much as possible, you know, remaining equal to itself. But that is, it's as uh, smooth as possible because if all these things is uh, smooth, but when we when you transform it, it will give us uh, localized objects. And so we use the definition of spillage that we had learned at that time from the siesta group in terms of saying, you know, what is the overlap, if you want, between a target dimension five manifold at certain K point and at a uh, next nearest neighbor. And so basically we iteratively minimize this mismatch between the manifold of dimension five at one K point and the manifolds of dimension five at the next nearest neighbor. So, so that is equivalent to say, maximizing the overlap as we sweep the Brillouin zone. And uh, this is how the algorithm is actually built. It doesn't matter, it's an iterative algorithm, but uh, what we are trying to do is uh, making uh, these uh, manifolds at every K points of dimension five as uh, equal to themselves as uh, possible. And uh, we build uh, this uh, manifold, and that's very important, uh, you know, because we have an entanglement case, uh, we build uh, this manifold of dimension five uh, as a linear combination of uh, stuff. And the stuff, of course, uh, cannot be only this five, uh, because sometimes you have six, and so you need to choose a mixture of those six uh, that gives you five. Uh, and so we could, uh, you know, decide uh, maybe we look at anything that sits in an energy window like this. Of course, you know, if we were to have an infinite plane wave basis set and an infinite set of bands, and if we were to take all those bands, we will get Dirac delta. So it's very important that we choose an energy range of states to mix to really get meaningful results. By mixing more and more and more states, 
uh, we can make uh, these manifolds uh, smoother and smoother, but less and less physical. That's where the heuristic of the problem uh, comes, uh, comes, comes in. So, but we do that, and so maybe we say we want to disentangle a manifold of dimension four using states in this uh, energy window here. And what we get, I never knew why it's black and white, but somehow it's black and white. We get something that looks a, a lot now as an anti-bonding Vanier function, as much as uh, you know the one that we got from this four was a bonding Vanier function. Or maybe we want to mix all of this and get a manifold of dimensionality eight. And that's, you see, very satisfactory. We get the sp3 tight binding basis of our Vanier functions. Again, we can do it uh, uh, with uh, copper. And uh, you see, we can uh, say mix only these states and then we get uh, this red manifold, or we can mix more and we get something that is smoother, but is less physical. In that sense, uh, there is uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, trade-off. And, you know, we can be creative, we can, you know, sort of decide, you know, how to choose appropriately. If you want in the disentanglement procedure, and that will become very important, um, there are choices to make for every blue state. You either want to keep it a season and throw in into the disentanglement procedure, but it will not change. You might want to throw it away completely or you might want to really mix it, okay? So for every blue state, remember you have these three possibilities, keep it as is, mix it or throw it away. And, uh, you know, at the beginning and for many years, we used just a uh, energy-based recipe uh, in which we would say, you know, these states we keep as they are, what we call the inner frozen window. These are states, uh, we mix them, what we call the uh, outer, disentanglement uh, window and something else uh, we thought away. But in some ways, we had all the tools to play around and build uh, red bands uh, that corresponds uh, to these uh, actually interstitial Vanier functions that give rise uh, to this uh, uh, parabolic uh, function. Oh, sorry, this was the interstitial uh, Vanier function that uh, you see it uh, reproduces uh, perfectly the bottom uh, parabolic part because this is what we had frozen. And then it builds a uh, smoother interpolator, completely unphysical in the middle. Somehow we had, as I said, uh, the math uh, and the algorithms uh, to play uh, with this. Uh, this is, uh, again, you'll probably be fed up uh, by uh, um, copper. This uh, in blue is what we obtain if we just did a projection uh, onto the d orbitals of copper. And this is if we started from there and did uh, a maximal uh, smoothness uh, that you see gives rise to better dispersing bands. And uh, you'll see that in a moment, uh, this uh, becomes also relevant uh, because now we can build linear functions that describe a very well target uh, part uh, of the energy dispersion. And there are applications that you'll see in the next uh, few days uh, where it's very important uh, to describe uh, uh, maybe the electron velocities to calculate uh, transport. And uh, there are nowadays uh, many powerful examples in uh, calculating uh, group velocity, calculating electron phonon. Here was calculating C uh, beta coefficient. But uh, let me sort of briefly, before I go to uh, a few more applications, also show you the recent and in some ways very simple but uh, very powerful developments that we have made on the theme of, uh, you know, making uh, the selection of the, say, projections and the energy windows uh, uh, completely automated. And uh, it all starts uh, from first uh, wanting to construct uh, an atomic uh, tight binding basis uh, for any solids. Here you see, for example, graphene, silicon, copper and strontium and strontium vanadate. Uh, graphene is very telling because in graphene and in carbon nanotube, it had always been 
difficult uh, to construct uh, Vanier functions uh, that uh, are the sp3 Vanier function giving rise, uh, sorry, the sp2 plus pz Vanier function giving rise uh, as bonding combination of sp2 to the sort of lower three bands. This is easy. The pz is easy. But what was very difficult uh, is uh, in the conduction manifold, uh, having obtained the correct sp2 that would give you anti-bonding combinations, because in the disentanglement here, it's really a very big jungle of spaghetti uh, where you have a lot of uh, free electron-like bands, uh, you know, in, in graphene. So what we did uh, with uh, Jung Feng Chao at BFL and Giovanni Pizzi uh, was to change uh, our uh, criterion uh, to decide uh, which state to keep, which state to throw, and which state to mix, uh, using uh, not uh, an energy criterion, uh, that is, we don't say low state, uh, we keep a state in between, uh, we mix and state high, we throw, but we use a projectability criterion. You see here in these fat bands, uh, we color them according to how much they project uh, onto the atomic orbitals of the pseudopotentials. And you see right away here, uh, you can see that there are a lot of uh, free electron-like bands that have zero projections on the atomic orbitals. And so it becomes very, very easy to throw away all these uh, delocalized uh, free electron-like bands uh, and only keep uh, states uh, that have uh, a projectability that is actually just above a few percents. Uh, uh, but uh, this uh, projectability threshold uh, allows us to pick up uh, also these you know, very high upper uh, states uh, that are the anti-bonding combination of the sp2. And now we can do this uh, for all materials. So this is, again, the case of graphene. And uh, so we keep uh, in the disentanglement uh, only states that have a projectability, say, between 2 and 98%. Above 98%, uh, we freeze. Uh, and at the end of the disentanglement and localization procedure, uh, we have uh, something that really describes everything that we want, uh, with, of course, the criterion that when you are intrinsically mixed uh, with other, say, non sp2 plus pc bands, uh, there is nothing that you can do unless uh, you enlarge the basis. But the bottom line is that this is now very robust and reliable. Um, we have tested it on our uh, internal and uh, in part public uh, um, 3D materials cloud database, what we call the MC3D database uh, that uh, contains uh, all known inorganic materials. In principle, there are 84,000. I think on the material clouds, you find the 45,000 smaller. But basically, Jun Feng took, uh, say, depending, I think, up to 48 atoms per primitive cell. It took uh, 22,000 materials uh, and built, uh, without any problem, 1.4 million Vanier functions. So now we are swimming in Vanier functions, and they are actually very, very good as we test them as uh, band interpolators. And the last element is that now that we have this absolutely robust and automated way to calculate the you know, first principle type banding Hamiltonian, that is to map the Koneshama band structures into the natural basis of atomic orbitals, you know, the 3P, the 3S, and so on and so forth. And so we have all our manifolds that describe both the valence and the conduction. Now we can remix them to have Vanier functions that are a mixture of those atomic tight binding orbitals that span maybe only this manifold or only that manifold or only that green manifold. We call them MR. So we had ML and we thought MR was nice. So manifold remix Vanier function, we take the projectability Vanier function, sorry, let me go back, that are built automatically, you see, for strontium vanadate, you would have the 4S, the 3D for vanadium, 5S, 5P, and for the strontium, the oxygen 2P, spanning both the valence and the conduction. And then we can now mix them um, very easily using uh, the, the concepts of uh, parallel transport and obstruction matrices uh, that have been built by Antoine Levitt. I, I won't go into that, but you know, just show you an example of like the top valence band 
of uh, uh, MOS2, it would have been very difficult uh, to build that uh, by figuring out on what uh, uh, projector it should be. But now that we had the data in our uh, full uh, tight binding manifold, uh, we can start, uh, say, at the gamma point uh, and do parallel transport. And every time we switch the VN zone, we sort of, uh, um, for those of you that do these things, uh, sort of transform back with the obstruction matrices until there are no obstruction in the three dimension. So this is just to say we have a full control on everything. And in the last five minutes, exactly, I give you some of the early examples of uh, uh, applications uh, that we were able to do uh, with this uh, Vanier functions as building blocks. I remind you, you know, you have seen the Parinello work on chemical intuition. There is all the connection with the very phase and the dialectic properties. There is the connection with the churn numbers and the topological obstruction and all the application in topology. Here, uh, because maybe I was always fascinated by actual applications uh, to the real world, uh, we wanted to build uh, the electronic structure of very large systems. And at the time, everyone was going berserk uh, about carbon nanotube as saving the world, exactly as qubit these days are saving the world. And so we were working on understanding how you could uh, change the electronic or optical properties of carbon nanotubes uh, with covalent uh, functionalizations. And the neat thing is that if you were to study a covalent functionalization on a carbon nanotube, but this uh, you know, is one of the block states, but uh, if you look uh, instead in the Vanier representation, you know, the chemist would be very happy. You see PZ orbitals on the carbon that are hybridized with the neighbors. You see exactly the covalent bonding of, in this case, the monovalent functionalization of these uh, phenyl uh, groups. Uh, and so what we did, uh, we worked uh, together with Marco Nardelli that uh, had, uh, you know, worked quite intensely in transport uh, based uh, on tight binding methods. And there was an entire theory developed uh, by say the group of uh, uh, data at Purdue and earlier on uh, Green's function methods approach uh, in which uh, basically you could uh, construct uh, from uh, the localized uh, tight binding representations uh, uh, the Green's functions, the self-energies, the couplings, and the transmission uh, matrix uh, of transport. And that's when we realized actually how excellent interpolators uh, of electronic structure the Vanier functions are. Because remember, what we are going to do is uh, we are building uh, from our electronic structure code the Vanier functions in the nanotube. They will look uh, like this. But then once we have uh, this, uh, once we have our tight binding basis, we can do block sums uh, and construct, uh, in principle, uh, back the Psi. But in particular, we are not going to construct it, but we are just going uh, to calculate uh, the matrix element of the Hamiltonian between a different uh, Psi. And uh, because uh, the Vanier functions are localized uh, in this uh, infinite sum here and infinite sum here, we can just uh, take matrix element, uh, you know, there is a block sum of Vanier function, matrix elements uh, that contain Vanier functions that sit in the same unit cell in the first neighbors. And then already in the second neighbors, if your primitive cell is large enough, this uh, will have gone to zero. And so you see, this is actually, if you take uh, a carbon nanotube, this is a metallic 5-5 five, five carbon nanotubes, with, uh, you see this Dirac crossing. This is, a, uh, so this is an armchair nanotube. This is a zigzag nanotube. And uh, we did calculations uh, where we had only say, the system is one dimensional, five K points. That is, we would calculate explicitly the electronic structure only at these uh, blue lines, construct the Vanier functions. And you see how wonderful in black, uh, perfect interpolators are of, uh, the red points, so that is what you would calculate, say, with a quantum espresso calculation done on a very fine mesh. And not only that, but I think that this was even more remarkable. I mean, this was, uh, say, for the case of a metallic 5.5 five, uh, nanotube, uh, um, where we would study a 5.5 five, five nanotube as, uh, say, 20 carbon atoms. We would study it in a supercell 
of 100 atoms, so five times larger, sampling only at gamma. So this is the super cell, sorry, the primitive Brillouin zone of the 100 atom system, sampling only at gamma. Uh, the system has a gap of two electron volts. We disentangle the right Vanier functions, and then with those, we interpolate at any k points, and we get these solid lines that you see match perfectly the quantum espresso calculation at every k point. But if you look at, say, at the density of states of the Vanoff singularities, we would get, uh, you see, the Vanoff singularity exactly at the right energy, even if we had never used, uh, you know, any state in here. We had only used uh, the states at gamma. Not only that, but if you were to take not uh, an infinite nanotube, you do just a calculation on a fragment and you build the Vanier functions, when uh, you do the block sums, again, uh, you get perfectly a metallic character and uh, the direct crossing, even if this object has, uh, again, a two electron volt gap. And this is another case from Arash Mostofi in nanowires in which you see, this is what you get from your, again, quantum espresso, EWSCF, there's a functional theory code. And you see these are, you know, it's your band of dispersion, but actually you can interpolate that very accurately uh, with uh, Vanier functions. And if you enlarge, you see how it uh, captures uh, all the crossing and the kissing of the bands. Okay, I'll skip this also the extension to say inelastic transport and uh, I'll finish here. Uh, this slide has nothing to do, but it's in honor of the chairman ourselves uh, since, uh, you know, this is a school, Andrea and I together with this Wolverton. It's not about when you function, but we have put a lot of what we understand about electronic structure and what we don't understand in this review paper, uh, if you are uh, interested. And so let me uh, go back uh, to the beginning. In the beginning is my end, we used to say. So uh, we have discussed this, you know, algorithm or class of algorithms to transform a block state into Vanier functions uh, applied uh, to solids, but anything uh, uh, we can control uh, which manifolds we work uh, thanks to Jung Feng now, it's uh, fully automated in Julia for the new generations, whatever Julia is. Uh, and uh, uh, with uh, a reminder that, uh, you know, the goal of having these localized orbitals, we started with the uh, descriptors of chemical bondings. Uh, we like very much the connection to the very phase theory of uh, polarization, uh, very much working as Lego building blocks, uh, interpolators of operators. Uh, in the last 10, 15 years, they've used uh, uh, massively by the community working on topological materials. And uh, for this audience, uh, you'll see in the next talks uh, that, uh, you know, this Vanier function are uh, excellent uh, approximations to the Kuhnman's orbitals or can be used as a natural manifold for our projectors. This is an older slide. People look much younger than they are. There is not a picture of me, luckily, but again, as I said, these are, you know, David, Ivo, Arash, Jonathan, Giovanni, the uh, very early efforts, but in particular, Antimo Marazza and Jun Feng Chao have uh, sort of, you know, driven some of the most recent developments. These days, we don't do transport uh, much, but these are some of the people that did transport. This is the group of Lausanne, of which you might recognize uh, many people. Uh, this is the funding and uh, anything that you want to know more about Vanier functions, the theory, the practice, the application, the code is all here on the Vanier.org code. Thanks a lot. Yeah, so, I mean, there are two elements. One is, uh, say, if you obtain a Vanier function, so with, say, PB, PB sol or PB sol plus U, of course, there are dramatic cases like what uh, um, Stefan was showing of, showing of iron oxide. So, you know, DFT plus U can really properly 
separator metallic manifolds that were driven by the over the localization of uh, say standard semi local uh, EFT. And so at that point uh, now you might have uh, maybe the right D2G metallic manifold around the Fermi energy and the right separation. So EFT plus you can do powerful things on the band structure and completely change the way manifold mix and dot mix. And uh, you can build a new function on either. But of course, uh, you know, if you think at a typical case in which manifolds are over mixed things in local DFT, if you wanted to build a separate sub manifolds of a new function, you would need to be smart and know what to do. And typically, DFT plus you bringing you more to the atomic limit will make it simple. So this is one thing. But you know, if you want, it's the question, um, you know. With this, what is the electronic structure that you want to start? Then we have so the other question is that <clears throat> rather than um, having, uh, say, atomic uh, projectors these days, and to the work of you know, we can have maximally localized many functions as projector in which uh, you apply the new correction. Uh, of course, if you take a standard, uh, you know, strontium strong, strong vanadate, one of you know the the, the, the classic so-called strongly correlated materials that are actually not strongly correlated, there wouldn't be probably much difference in choosing one or the other. Uh, but there might be a lot of cases where it might be interesting actually to you know, choose the, the, the right one for you. Um, one of the very interesting uh, discussions earlier on, if you, some of you might remember the overbinding of molecules to metal surfaces, the, the copper monoxide on platinum 111, is the key example. And uh, what is there in terms of physics uh, is an uh, over hybridization of the room of the copper monoxide uh, onto the uh, platinum. And so, if you know what you are doing, uh, you can actually choose uh, Vanier functions uh, as projector to keep uh, that over hybridization from happening and improve the binding energetics of uh, copper monoxide. So, uh, it can be flexible, but we need to know what to do. Uh, so, uh, at the beginning of your talk, you were spewing out to a question mark to serve the related to the dependence that you actually have your work with your functions on choosing the energy that you go. And you showed an example where you can actually find the near function getting that. And then my question would be how would you choose what would be the most correct representation for that? But I, I think your strategy on projectability job, of course, does this address this particular problem in the sense that do you would you have the recipe for constructing a unique near function that you think is the best representation of your problem, or is it is there are still different features that you can have uh, different representations? And yeah, yeah. So I'll take the case of silicon uh, that is uh, important, as you know. Sort of, you know, we have uh, an indirect band gap, uh, eighty percent along uh, the gamma to x uh, direction, uh, and that uh, makes it uh, very sensitive now. Because, uh, you know, it's a high symmetry line, but it's in the middle of nowhere in a bit of a coincidental, in a bit of a coincidental way. So there are two elements here. One is uh, what is our minimal tight binding model that we want to build for silicon. That is, uh, we can have just a tight binding model with the SMP orbitals that span eight bands. But uh, it might not be sufficient to really give you, uh, you know, a very good representation of this minimum. And then uh, maybe you want to add uh, the 3D orbitals, uh, and then uh, you now have uh, a tight binding model of, uh, you know, four uh, sp3, sorry, four uh, sp3 on one side, four sp3 on another side, and the 3D uh, um, uh, electron that is going to give you an. Here, we don't have the projectability in this plot of the 3D states, but you would have many more, you know, fat colored bands here. And then you have naturally constructed a tight binding model that is 
necessarily more accurate because it has uh, more freedom. So you can have now a systematic way of, you know, improving the quality of your tight binding model. I don't know if we start to have, uh, you know, hundreds of orbitals, how much, uh, you know, the disentanglement over there uh, will take place. But it's very easy to go, say, from having just S and P to have the D. And then again, it depends on what you want to do with this. And, uh, you know, do you want only to describe the bottom of this? So you want to do a manifold remixing of only the conduction and so on. So it's not, I mean, I think depending on what you want to do, you still need to think a little bit. Huh? But the combination of this algorithm and chat GPT means that by the time you retire, there is nothing left to do and we can all go surfing basically. Or not bound, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, right now, and probably Jun Feng would know if this is uh, so. A few months ago, what we were doing is we were taking uh, the open MX atomic solver in a, you know, a really, uh, for the atom in a cylinder. So you would have also say, I think it's relevant already for the 3D of silicon, they would be bound. So in some way, the question is indeed uh, what to do to have as a projectors uh, for very high states uh, that are not, uh, that are not bound. Uh, we don't have, uh, you know, a statement. My favorite solution would be to put uh, the atom in the pseudo potential code into a confining potential that is one minus the charge density. So, you know, so, or it's, uh, you know, it's built around uh, being uh, stronger where the charge density goes to zero and then having, uh, you know, quite a, a broad palette of localized states. And uh, indeed, I don't know, Edward might also have been uh, sort of looking at this or anyhow, so yeah. So I don't think we have a universal solution, but uh, working on this, but it's, yeah, it's indeed a point. Huh? Because if you want, uh, the higher you go, the more tenuous become this relation between uh, the atomic projector, so that maybe we forced to project and uh, bands that are uh, really free electron bands and so on. But, you know, my sense uh, is that, uh, you know, this is maybe the important thing to remember, you know, if we take this, 22,000 materials uh, that are, you know, insulators. Uh, I mean, nothing magnetic, I think, here. I don't know, to be honest, but uh, insulator and metals. Uh, we do a two milliliter volt error in the band distance. Uh, going uh, N2 is uh, looking at the states up to two electron volt. Uh, we have several measures, you know, up to two electron volt above the Fermi energy and 10 up to 10 electron volt. And again, they look very, very good, all these interpolations. Yeah. 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 Now, is working exactly on this. That is, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, you know what the point is saying, that you have to kill your parents. Huh? So Zhu Peng is going to make sure that, you know, nothing of what I've done is useful anymore. Uh, what is very interesting is that, indeed, a lot of, uh, if you want, uh, the mathematics of this is very easily done in Julia. And so he's exactly working on a concept of having a, a single global minimization step, putting everything together. So absolutely correct. Thanks. Yeah. So you suggest that 